In the year 1603, diseased rats once again unleashed the bubonic plague upon Great Britain. The Black Death caused great suffering and despair across the land. The new king took his throne. In his first year of reign, he foiled two conspiracies to overthrow him. Two years later, a small band of provincial Catholics failed in their assassination attempt, the gunpowder plot. King James had them all tried and executed. The new century started with fear, paranoia, and political and religious uncertainty, reaching its climax in 1607. A great tsunami caused devastating floods throughout England. As the year went on, the death toll rose to abnormally high rates as disaster continued to strike. The summer was unusually hot and dry, causing mass crop failure, devastating farming across the country. And Halley's Comet, the same comet that signalled the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD, and the Norman Conquest in 1066 appeared in our skies again in the late summer of 1607. The people of England feared these events were the signs of God's displeasure. Driven by this and years of persecution in their own country, a small group of separatists set sail for a new life. In and around the little village of Scrooby in North Nottinghamshire, a small group of non-conformists made a decision that would shape the course of history. But first they would have to challenge their government and its politically driven church. When Elizabeth came to the throne after Bloody Queen Mary, who was Catholic, instead of going back to a reformed church as it was under King Edward and Archbishop Cranmer, Elizabeth instead had a church that was very much like it was at the end of King Henry's reign. Queen Elizabeth realised that England had moved far too out of mainstream Catholicism to ever go back to it, and since her father's break with Rome, Catholic countries had arisen to threaten the security of England and her crown. Elizabeth found herself between a rock and a hard place, so she brought England back to Protestantism through the so-called Middle Way. This is All Saints Church in Babworth. This church is widely regarded by many people as the spiritual and intellectual birthplace of the United States of America because it was here that the Reverend Richard Clifton was sacked for his uh, separate, holding his separatist views. Now we have to understand that this, this time it wasn't a church that we would know today. In those days a church was a very different place. In fact, it was really um, an extension of the state because it was here that people were appointed to uh, positions in ministry because of their position in society, the families into which they were born. And if you did not attain church, you were fined. And if you didn't pay your fines, eventually you were sent to jail. And everything really came to a head when in 1593, Elizabeth brought in an act against Puritans. It made it illegal to be a separatist or any other sort of dissenter. And that's when we have executions taking place in London and a general worrying amongst the population about what would happen. Whether to carry on wanting reform or whether to do as they were told and face the consequences. In short, the separatists desired to live quiet and peaceful lives and to meet in small groups where they could read the Bible together, discuss the scriptures together, pray together in the informal setting of people's homes. So they set up what we know today as house churches. They desired to move away from formal worship and what had become empty religion and the incomprehensible Latin liturgy. They wanted to move away from the traditional church and what they saw as all its baggage, which included the vestments of priesthood and making the sign of the cross and kneeling at communion and a number of other things that they could not find in the Bible. Thomas Cartwright, a Cambridge scholar who taught that the church was only half reformed, was particularly vocal. 
He was such a dynamic theologian and preacher that the windows were taken out of his church so that crowds in the street could hear him preach. He studied the book of Acts carefully and taught that the New Testament church did not speak of bishops as we know them today. He also outdebated the Archbishop of York in the presence of the Queen. And he argued that the sovereignty of God did not need the support of kings and queens. And so he was sacked and soon fled to Geneva. But before he left, he started a separatist movement. And following on from this was another separatist leader, Robert Brown, who fled to Holland to avoid arrest. Our separatists in Scrooby and Gainsborough were followers of this Robert Trouble Church Brown, who came out of Peter House. In fact, William Brewster was uh, at university at the same time as him, as was Rose Hickman's son, Anthony, who we now believe was also a separatist. And it must have been dreadful for these people because they knew that friends of theirs, people they knew personally, had been executed already for being separatists by Elizabeth. And even as we moved into King James's reign, there were no executions so far. But who was to say there weren't going to be any? James was a political Protestant, but in reality he hated Protestants. He particularly resented what John Knox had accomplished in 1560 when he set up the Presbyterian Church in Scotland. And so James uh, assembled the Hampton Court Conference in 1604, and that was to lead to bitter disappointment all round because all the different groups thought they were going to get a good slice of the pie. But although he was the son of Scotland's devoutly Roman Catholic Queen Mary, he could not afford the risks and the turmoil of trying to bring England back into mainstream Catholicism, any more than Elizabeth could for that matter. And uh, this disappointment gave rise to the gunpowder plot in 1605, which shook him incredibly. The problem with being a separatist in this area is that there was still a great number of people who were Catholic and who wanted the country to return to Catholicism. There were also a large number of people very happy with the Elizabethan church settlement, the conservative Anglicans, and both of these groups would have seen the separatists as a threat, a disruption. And so if they knew that they were meeting in secret, they'd tell the authorities. It was treason to be meeting in secret. So it was a very dangerous thing to do. In about 1606, Robinson, Smith and Clifton left the Church of England. Their separation from the state church caused an uproar locally, and then the pressure intensified. People were being watched and generally harassed, and there was the looming threat of much worse to follow. Brewster, meanwhile, lost his job as postmaster and was fined 20 pounds, which was a huge sum of money in those days was fined for being disobedient in matters of religion. In the face of this though, in the face of being outlawed and persecuted, our group of separatists in the Midlands decided to meet in secret, to carry on with their belief. They weren't going to conform. So a lot of them would go and listen to preachers of their own ideals, such as Richard Clifton at Babworth, even if it meant walking considerable distances just to hear him preach. Of course, eventually, even he was dismissed from the church, and so they had no option than to meet in secret, and it was dangerous. As the separatists found themselves under increasing suspicion and pressure, John Smith held meetings at Gainsborough, but away from the church, perhaps at the home of Sir William Hickman, Brewster and Clifton had been attending these meetings, but it was a there and back journey of 18 miles for them. So other meetings were held in Brewster's home at Scrooby, where Robinson joined them. This became known as the Scrooby Congregation, comprising the core group of leaders who eventually became known as the Pilgrim Fathers of America. Well, in the early days, before the Hampton Court Conference, which saw a lot of clergy being dismissed for holding separatist and Puritan views, 
you could go to a, a church nearby where there may be a vicar preaching who are sympathetic to the separatist cause and have what would be seen by many as a pure service, a reformed service, strictly against the bidding of the local bishop. But you could have a service the way you believed it should be. Babworth was a prime example with Richard Clifton. Richard Clifton was a phenomenal preacher, so much so that the teenager William Bradford, who lived in Osterfield, would walk here on a Sunday, 12 miles here, 12 miles back again, just to hear him preach. He, in fact, he inspired many, many people, and the reason why this is the spiritual and intellectual birthplace of the United States of America is that he instilled in people's hearts, through the scriptures, uh, the desire for personal autonomy, for freedom. But this couldn't go on after the Hampton Court settlement. After this happened, you would have to meet in private. And there was a congregation held here at Gainsborough Old Hall under the auspices of John Smith, a defrocked preacher from Lincoln who was a separatist. And at Scrooby, where we know that Richard Clifton must have gone after he was defrocked and thrown out of the church at Babworth. Right, so this is St Wilfrid's Church in Scrooby. 400 years ago, it's an unenviable position to be sat here in these pews and thinking, well, it's not a case of leaving the church anymore. It's a case of trying to escape from the country to somewhere where you could follow your religion the way that you thought God was telling you. We used to travel these days, but in those days, most people didn't even leave their own village, let alone leave their family and friends, their possessions, even their trades, to go to a foreign country. Following on from this outbreak of persecution, both the Scrooby and Gainsborough congregations decided to look for freedom in exile. But it would have been illegal and very difficult to simply leave, and so they had to escape. Just prior to 1607, when our group of separatists from Scrooby and Gainsborough were thinking of leaving the country, of escaping, there were a number of natural events that happened that would have caused them some alarm. One was a, a flooding. There had been a tsunami in the south of the country and there were pamphlets issued which would have reached up here and it would have been seen as a sign of God or God's unhappiness with the situation. Another was a comet came over. We know it's Halley's Comet, but at that time it wasn't known what it was and it would have been in the sky as a big marker that something, something was amiss. And also there were a number of extra deaths in 1607 due to plague and unforeseen circumstances and the crops didn't do so well. Obviously God was talking to our people. It was time to act. Well in the spring of 1607 we have um, the persecution becoming almost unbearable for the separatists around this area. John Smith's congregation at Gainsborough escaped that year. We're not certain when, but pretty early on. After that, the Scrooby congregation knew that their time was coming. They would have to leave the country if they were going to survive as separatists. They certainly weren't going to conform. There was no other option left open to them. So in the autumn of that year, they made an escape attempt from Boston. It failed. Their captors, then looking for money, subjected them to humiliating body searches. They were then herded into small boats and taken to Boston, where crowds gathered to watch them being hauled before the magistrates, and where messengers were sent to the Privy Council in London with news of the arrest. The women and children were released, because in those days they were considered chattels and not considered responsible for their own actions. The mariners who had betrayed them took everything they had. They must have felt helpless. And on top of that, the memory, the thought of recent imprisonments, the executions before of other separatists, it must have been running wild for those women and children's minds that the menfolk weren't going to just be imprisoned. 
They might be taken away and executed at any moment. But the separatists were allowed to return home, although seven leaders, including Brewster, Robinson and Clifton, were sent to the principal courts in Lincoln before being eventually set free as well. As soon as the worst of the winter weather had gone and spring had broken, our group needed to make their second escape attempt. As the women and children had suffered so badly uh, on the escape from Boston, this time it was decided to send them by the riverway along to the River Humber. They would rendezvous with the men who meanwhile had gone overland and had gone to Hull to find another ship's captain willing to take them to Holland. This time they chose a Dutch master. The men walked back to the rendezvous point and the ship picked them up. They hadn't yet reached where they were going to find the women and the women had arrived early and being seasick because the Humber is tidal they'd put into the shore for a while so that the children might have a little bit of respite. But unfortunately when the time came for them to join the men folk, the tide was wrong and the little craft they were on couldn't get out to the ship and they were stranded. It must have been dreadful for the men folk because as they saw the women come into sight, they could also see further along the coast, they could see men, armed men, coming for the women. And so panicking, the Dutch captain weighed anchor and sailed away without the remaining men and the women and children. The few men who had already embarked could only stand by and watch hopelessly as their families and friends were rounded up and arrested. These men had only the clothes in which they stood because it had been agreed that the women would carry the money and whatever household goods they could bring with them. The men were crying, they couldn't get to their women folk and they knew that they were going to be arrested and the women were screaming with the children because they were terrified. They could see their men and couldn't get to them. It must have been dreadful for both sides, dreadful. The ship's captain though was more worried about his own skin if you like. He said to the men, we're going. If I'm caught, my ship will be confiscated. And so the ship turned about and went to Holland, leaving the women stranded on the shore to face whatever fate bewaited them. And then, just when it seemed that a disaster couldn't get any worse, it did. A terrible storm blew up and drove them all the way to the Norwegian coast. And the seas were so rough that the mariners actually went below decks with our separatists and left the ship just to roll on its own accord. It must have been terrible to be below decks with seamen who were saying, we're all going to drown, we're doomed. And they must have thought that they were going to drown. As William Bradford would write much later in his journal in of Plymouth Plantation, at the height of this storm, they prayed, they prayed in earnest, Lord, even now, even now you can save us. And with that, the storm abated. They got control of the ship again and were able to make their way back to Holland. When they reached there, the master of the ship, his whole family were on the quayside. They could see the ship in the offing and couldn't believe their eyes because in that one storm hundreds of ships were lost and yet this one ship had made it back to great rejoicing. Meanwhile their families had been sent from place to place and court to court where nobody seemed to know what to do with them. They could not be sent to their former homes because these were exactly that, they had been sold. Eventually, after being shuffled from town to town, they were released, but that was good. It meant that our men in Holland could come back to England very quietly, one by one, grab their women folk and spirit them away out of the country. And that's what happened. 
In Amsterdam, most of the English exiles were unhappy in the city and found it very difficult to cope with the culture shock they experienced. It was far too populous for rural folk and the language barrier was immense and there was very little opportunity for them to use their rural skills. Well, both the congregation from Gainsborough and Scrooby ended up in Amsterdam. But after a year, the Scrooby congregation decided to move to Leiden. William Bruce had got a teaching post there at the university and permission to settle by the town elders. And that's where they stayed for the next 12 years. They learnt new trades, mainly in the cloth industry, supported themselves and bought their own house. And William Brewster was able, with John Robinson, to write pamphlets to send back to England to stir up the spirit of those separatists and like-thinking folk left behind. But life was not easy for the English exiles and some members of the community returned home. The original community, meanwhile, was growing older and tired and worried about the future. The children were growing up exposed to the temptations of the city and the foreign culture and they were not willing to share their parents' burdens. Furthermore, it was increasingly obvious that the children would become Dutch Protestants, not English Protestants. And more importantly, there was a threat of war. There'd been a long treaty with Spain. That was going to come to the end. So our group didn't know what to do. Were they going to stay in Holland and become involved in war or consumed by a larger Dutch Reformed Church? They couldn't return to England. But there was one place they could go and still be Englishmen. And as William Bradford writes, they were proud Englishmen. And that was the New World colonies. In the New World, they would be free of bishops and certainly free to carry on their religious life according to their own beliefs. Well, through their agents in England, our group managed to get a patent that is permission to settle in Virginia. And for this purpose, they bought their own ship called the Speedwell from Delft Haven in Holland. And they sailed to England with the intention of meeting up with a, an aging cargo ship called the Mayflower. And the two ships would then make the crossing to the Atlantic to Virginia. They started at Southampton. The Speedwell was a fine ship, no problems with her up until then. But as they left Southampton, she started to take on water. There was obviously a problem with her. So the group had to set in to the next port, and that was Dartmouth. In Dartmouth, they inspected the Speedwell again and could not find any major leak so they set sail, only to return to land again, this time in Plymouth, where it was decided to get rid of the speedwell. It was just completely unseaworthy for the ocean voyage. By that time, some of our separatists were so frightened of drowning, and there wasn't room for everyone on the Mayflower, so a certain number were left behind. But the main group of our congregation made that fateful journey across the Atlantic. And of course, with all these setbacks, it was getting late into the season. And there were storms, and the crossing was dreadful. Not only that, they'd used up a lot of their supplies. Our diet was so bad back then. We didn't have a lot of fresh vegetables and fruit. And within a month, even with a modern diet, you can deplete your vitamin C and fall victim to scurvy which was a nasty disease. And although only one person died on the trip across, many died in the months following their arrival in the New World. And undoubtedly, this was the after effects of scurvy. It ravaged them like a plague. In November, the Mayflower reached the New World, but they weren't in Virginia as planned. Instead, they'd pitched up in what we now call New England, just off Cape Cod. The landscape 
The landscape that greeted them must have been dreadful. It must have been a terrible disappointment. Because when they looked out, the shoreline was barren. It wasn't like the beautiful Lincolnshire that they'd come from. They must have felt betrayed. They found somewhere to settle, and their first houses were built on Christmas Day. But many of the people didn't leave the Mayflower until the following spring, and by that time half their numbers died. The Mayflower, who had started off as a sweet ship she'd carried wine, was a sweet-smelling ship. It must have been little more than a floating coffin, smelling of death. The people of the Mayflower are considered the founders of America, though Virginia had been settled 14 years earlier. And within 10 years of the Mayflower group having established themselves in the New World, there was another bigger settlement established around Massachusetts Bay. So why are the Scrooby men considered to be the Pilgrim Fathers? It's these struggles, it's the sacrifice that these colonists in particular made that have led them to be held in such regard today. For instance, while they were still on that ship before they'd even started to settle ashore, they got together and they made a blueprint, if you like, of how they were going to live their lives. It was called the Mayflower Compact and they would have the freedom of religion, freedom of speech. All these things later become enshrined in the American Constitution. And that's why this group of separatists, mainly from Lincolnshire, are held in such deep esteem by Americans today. In 1936, in a declaration to Mayflower descendants, Samuel Eliot Morrison, a respected historian and author with two Pulitzer Prizes, said, The vital factor in this little group is the faith in God that exalted them and their small enterprise to something of lasting value and enduring interest. The story of their patience and fortitude and the workings of unseen force which bears up heroic souls in the doing of mighty errands as often as it is read or told, quickens the spiritual forces in American life, strengthens faith in God and confidence in human nature. The Pilgrim Fathers and the people who followed were oppressed groups, forced out of their countries through conflict of religion, conscience and freedom of speech. The essence of this story continues to be told all over the world. Every day, thousands of refugees and immigrants flee their countries for a better life, to escape oppression. But the eternal image of the Pilgrim Fathers, man standing up and fighting for what he believes against whatever struggles he may face, is something to which everyone should adhere.